So this is lecture 31 of ECE 503. So in this lecture, we're going to be talking about the concept of linear prediction. What we're going to be talking about is the reason why in lecture 30 we spent so much time talking about random processes, about whites and stationary processes, um, about random phenomenon, is that we can use signal processing to sort of look ahead and find out the next sample. So what we're going to look at is something called ARMA, MA, and AR prediction. So there's an autoregressive moving average, and we're going to look at what this means, right? Like, what's the physics behind it? Um, autoregressive and moving average processes as well. So, you know, so we have a random phenomenon. We can design filters. So this is totally DSP. We can design a filter that if we give it current and past samples, we can then say, oh, the next sample should be this, right? And I'll explain how we create that filter, right? So that's, that's DSP, is building those filters. So, so first of all, let's, let's look at WSS. Let's look at whites and stationary random processes. But this time, so if you notice in the last lecture, I kind of cheated a little bit. What I did is I talked about continuous time. Now I'm going to talk about the discrete time equivalent. And so the discrete time equivalent, instead of an x of t, I have an x of n. Instead of that guy would be r x x of t, or tau, it's now gamma x x of m, where m is the relative separation in discrete time between two points in a random process. So let, let me draw this, because again, it's like, huh, what? So, continuous time, we had the random process x of t. Discrete time, it is x of n. In continuous time, we had r x x of tau for a wide sense stationary random process. In discrete time, it's gamma x x of m. So, m serves as the discrete time equivalent of tau. Remember, you know, in the continuous time, we had this, we had this, and this is with respect to t. But we don't have a continuum of values in discrete time. So this might look a little bit different, right? So this, mm, I'm not sure how to draw it. 0, 1, 2, 3, bless you, 4, 5, 6, and so on, n. What happens is we might have this, like, you know, and then the next instance. So these guys, so we might have something that looks like this. I'm using the line to sort of signify that this guy corresponds to the sample in the sample space omega 1, omega 2, omega 3, Right? But essentially, we don't have really anything in the middle as opposed to the continuum of values across all t. So here we have a continuum, and here it's just discrete time values. Right? And what we're interested in is that at one value of n and another value of n, we're really interested, just as before, as to what is its autocorrelation? What is the correlation between two discrete time instances of a random process, x of n, separated by m time instances, time values? And so from that, we can then look at the power spectral density, Sxx of f. And in the discrete time, it's going to be gamma xx of omega or z, depends on, what, pick your poison. So, knowing this, what we can then do is given these functions, we can do the same sort of trick we did before. So if we know it's white sense stationary, if we know it's LTI, 
We know the relationship between input and output in terms of their characteristics. There are autocorrelation functions, there are power spectral densities, if we know what the LTI system H of Z is equal to. Now, now I'm going to pull a little trick. Okay? Not really a trick, like a concept. So it is possible okay, that we can feed into a linear causal filter. We can feed into it. We can feed into it white noise, right? So what does white noise mean? White noise means that there is an equivalent contribution in energy at every frequency instant in its frequency representation. So if we go, like, so we have Z here. So in the Z domain, or in general, like if you look at the frequency domain, all and across the frequency, it's a constant, right? And why do we call it white? White light, right? White light has every color equally represented across all colors, all frequencies, even beyond the visible color range. All like white light has equal frequency contributions across the spectrum, right? And then we feed it into this H of Z to produce x of n. Okay? We call this, we call this, okay, the innovation representation. So with white noise, if we have an h of z, we can produce a signal n, h, uh, sorry, x of n. And x of n is nothing more than the convolution of h of n with w of n. On the other hand, the, if we take the inverse of h of z and we feed in x of n, we call this a whitening process. We take that signal that was generated using white noise. We take the inverse of the filter that made that signal from white noise. And because we're like inverting the process, we can get white noise at the output. Right? So as a result, this is actually quite powerful stuff. So what happens is we can either create signals from white noise or we can create white noise from signals if we know how, what H of Z is equal to. So let's take this one step further. So let's look at this guy here. Okay. Or actually even before that. So when I say something is white, Right, this omega n, sorry, wn. So we know that, okay, so what does it mean, like in the time domain, what does it mean to be white? Okay, so let's look at this. Okay. So we know that this guy is going to be some sort of convolution. Okay? And we don't like doing convolutions, don't we? Okay? So instead, what we know is that, you know, we take W of n and we find out that, okay, what is, when we say it's white in the time domain, what does this mean? What does white mean in the time domain? totally uncorrelated with everything but itself. So this means this guy here, this function, what's really cool about this guy? What should it be equal to? It should be non-zero only when m is equal to zero, right? So what this means is that if I take Omega, if, if I, let's say, take this random, pro so let's say I take this no noise, right, this, this guy here, omega n, right, and what I do is, let's say I try and correlate it with its, so I find the autocorrelation of this. So what's the definition? So E, right, and then n plus m, I believe there's a complex conjugate. 
right? So that this is our autocorrelation function, right? Autocore. What we find is that when we evaluate this, there will only be one non-zero value, and that is when m is equal to zero. So what this means is that only when this guy and this guy are identical, you know, and when we take the expected value of him or whatever, when we do, when we calculate that value, that's going to produce a non-zero non-zero output. Everything else, when we, when we evaluate it in the end, will come out to zero in the wash. So as a result, how do we represent something like that in terms of a function of m? And that's going to be equal to the delta function. What also turns out is if you evaluate this guy, okay, when you evaluate this guy, what you're going to find is that it's not going to be equal to 1. It's going to be equal to sigma squared of omega. What, what's going to be equal to, it's going to be equal to the variance of w, right? So sigma squared is the variance of w. And delta m means that every, every value of m is going to be equal to 0, except when um, m is equal to 0, in which case it's going to be equal to this guy. So what your autocorrelation function is going to look like is this. Okay. So if you look at that from the time domain, and you take two points on the random process, zero correlation, zero correlation, zero correlation. So everywhere you shift, so you look at any two time instances on your random process, they will all, every time you do the correlation between every two time instances, it will produce zero correlation except when it is the exact same point. When it's correlated with itself, it will always correlate with itself, and it will be equal to its variance. Otherwise, always zero. So when someone says that's a white process, it means totally uncorrelated except when the time instant is with itself, right? So what is the Fourier transform of that? It's going to be flat spectrally, right? So if you take the Fourier transform, it's going to look like, let's say in the omega domain, it's going to look like that. And it's going to be omega squared. So let's use that wonderful property that we looked at the last time, which is, um, remember that we have a relationship between the, in, in the continuous time, we had SYY of F is equal to the magnitude squared of h f s x x of f, right? And so in the discrete time, we have, oh, sorry, we have gamma y y of little omega, and that's going to be equal to the magnitude squared of h omega squared gamma x x of omega. We know if the input is white, it's going to be equal to uh, sigma w squared. So now what we've got is our relationship, our output, is really going to be dominated by the shape of the magnitude squared of h, the transfer function. Because this guy here is a constant. Right? What's kind of interesting, what's kind of interesting is, let's say if we keep it in the z domain. What you've got is the following. So if we keep it in the z domain, so we have like, you know, here's our analog, uh, no, our um, Fourier transform frequencies and such. What ends up happening is if we keep it in the z domain, what we'll see is, remember, so I have this magnitude squared of h of omega, right? And, and what we could do, I, I'm interchanging between z and o, o omega. So I'm going between the z transform and the um, discrete time, the z transform and the discrete time Fourier transform, but I'm interchanging. But what happens is that magnitude squared 
of h of omega, which is whatever the equivalent is in the z-transform domain. That guy over there, what's, what is bz over az times bz minus 1 over az minus 1? What is that? So a, sorry, bz over az is h of z, and bz minus 1 over az minus 1 is hz minus 1. That's a complex conjugate of h of z. This guy, okay, that guy on the top, that equation, is equal to the magnitude squared of the transfer function times the variance of my white process. So the goal is, so I have this here, this h, right? And I can represent this in terms of a summation of coefficients in the numerator and that in the denominator. So I can break this up into a series of summations, top and bottom. And this can give me a difference equation here. And this is, this is the cool part. So what this tells me, right, this relationship tells me, is I can have three different types of difference equations. I can have the case where all the actions in the denominator, where it's 1 over az and bz is equal to 1. We call this an autoregressive process. Why? Because it's autoregressive, because what I'm looking at is I'm trying to predict the current value of x based on past values of x plus the white noise value at that same time instant. There's also when we only consider the numerator and the denominator is equal to 1. We call that a moving average, right? And the moving average is I look at past values of the input to give me the, the pr present value, what I'm looking for. And then there's ARMA, autoregressive moving average. And what that does is it looks at both past values of the output, and it looks at past values of the input to give me the current output. So um, maybe graphically this would make more sense. So let's say we have something over time, right? Here's a value, here's a value, here's a value. Okay, so this is n. So, so what does autoregressive mean? So suppose I want to find out what is the value going to be here at this time instant. What do I do? What happens is, so let's say this is x of n. What I do is I look at these guys, and through an equation, what I do is I say, OK, based on that, I'm, I believe that at this time instant, I'm going to have that value. Right? And so um, what we do is we have x of n is going to be equal to a sum of weighted, so let's say k, so a k Let's say 1 to, let's say, n or something. So what happens is it's going to be equal to all past values. So these are past values. And also perhaps one, the current value of the noise. So we call this autoregressive, or AR. So what I'm doing is I'm looking at the past values of the output to give me some insight on what the current value of the output should be equal to. Moving average, on the other hand, is I'm looking at omega n and all its values, and I'm saying, OK, I'm taking all these guys, and from that, I'm going to produce x of n from that. So what I'm doing is I'm taking these guys, and I'm computing, I'm summing them up, I'm averaging them, and I'm saying it's equal to x of n. Then let's say I take a few more points, I consider only n points there, and I compute x of n plus 2, because I went over, actually it looks like 4. And then let's say there's several more points, and I slide the window. So what I've got is I got this window, 
and I'm sliding it on the, across the inputs, I'm averaging them, weighted average, and producing an output every time. I call that a moving average. Now, ARMA, okay, and, and it's different than AR because at AR, I'm also using just the current value of the input plus a weighted average of the pass outputs. ARMA does both. Both AR, like you see on top, and MA. So I'm taking both uh, at moving average of the input values and a moving average or like a sum, a weighted sum of all pass output values to produce the current output value. That is ARMA. It also sounds cool. So, given that, we have that. So, you know, if you want to know a little bit more, you can look at section 12.2.2 in your textbook. From this, we can generate a few very interesting tools that are signal processing based. The first is called the forward linear predictor. And the way the forward linear predictor works, and we're going to look at, you know, remember lattice structures? We're going to see that soon. Woohoo! So what happens is, um, so a, predict, a, linear, a forward predictor essentially forms a prediction on a value of xn by weighted combination of past values of the output. So xn minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4, and then that a, those coefficients, those a, p of k's, that's weighing. So what would be, like, you know, for instance, in a lot of cases, what would make a very sensible weighing function for pass values of the output? Like, you know, sometimes we might weigh all pass values equally as important. But in real life, what do we care? Like, you know, in a lot of cases, if we're trying to form some sort of decision based on past values. Those that are older, oh, sorry, those that are older tend to be weighed less, right? Because they're more out of date, they're not as current. Those that occur sooner, we might want to weigh more, right? So moving average, we might consider the older values maybe not as relevant because time changes and become more out of date compared to the current situation. And those that occur more recently, we can weigh them Heavily, more heavily. And so a, a forward predictor is given by this expression here. This f of p of n is equal to, okay? So no, not the forward predictor. I misspoke. Forward prediction error. So the actual value and subtract off its estimate. So remember, anything with a hat, en français, c'est un si complex. So in French, it's called a C-complex. But what happens is C-complex means always that it's an estimate, and without is the actual value. So when we have x of n minus x of n hat, what this means is that we're finding the estimate versus the actual. We find the difference that produces the estimation, the, the forward prediction error. Now, we know what the estimate is. It's this guy here. Right? The weighted sum of all past values of the output. And then what happens is we subtract that off from the actual, when we actually observe it. And that gives us the error. And this gives us this structure here, right? Current output, I mean the current output value when we actually observe it. And what happens is we, can, we do the forward linear predictor. And it's kind of interesting because notice that my predictor, all I need is just the last value, right? And that last value, we then apply it to this, this, uh, pre, um, you know, this weighing function, the series of weighing functions, and that will give us the prediction error. We subtract one from the other, and that FP of N says, oh, this is how much error you have in your forward predictor. Now, this is kind of cool because that f p of n, it was not quite clear. Like you look at it and say, well, I only see x of n minus 1, right? Right? What happens is it's kind of cool because from this, there is a recursion that's happening. 
what happens is I'm feeding back from, and you don't see it here, but you see it here. I'm feeding back. Okay, I have xn minus 1. What about xn minus 2, n minus 3, n minus 4, n minus 5, n minus 6? So what I want to do is I want past values of the output. And I have previous four prediction errors from those guys as well. And I'm talking about recursion. And this is where my lattice now comes in. Remember the lattice? I have a cascade of all these stages. So I have the first stage. So f0 of n, that's my zeroth forward prediction error. First stage, first prediction error. Second stage, second prediction error, and so on to the p stage. And at each stage, what I have is I have that lattice structure, right? I have the reflection coefficients, and then I have this g thing, the bottom branch with all the delays. What's that? That's my backward prediction error. <gasps> backward prediction error. So now I'm, I set the stage to create a lattice structure from this. So there is a purpose to a lattice, right? We were like wondering, what, why such, so, so much complicated DSP, other than to make my life complicated? Well, this. And so what happens is I have the backward linear predictor, I have the forward linear predictor, I have the errors associated with both, and what this will give me, okay, at the end of the day, so I have the backward linear predictor, I have the forward linear predictor, backward linear pre the backward predictor error, right, given by this expression, I can make a matrix representation just as before. So I can have this AMZ and BMZ matrices, right, matrices, and, and so those guys, right, those are our coefficients. Those are the coefficients of the A and the B, right, that form that H. That's the weighing function of the past, the past outputs. And what I can do is set it up such that a m of z and b m of z is equal to a combination of the reflection coefficients z minus 1, its complex conjugate, and the previous version, the a m minus 1 of z and the b m minus 1 of z. So what we can do is, through this lattice structure in different stages, so what I can do is bootstrap essentially my system. I can create the forward and backward prediction, as well as, their, as well as their associated errors, and then eventually build out AM of Z and BM of Z. And so, what ends up happening is that we get this structure. We get this beautiful equation. AM of Z is equal to AM minus 1 of Z. So this is the previous set of coefficients before we add the nth stage. And then we also throw in the backward prediction coefficients, right? With the reflection coefficient here, Km and Z minus 1 for good measure. And so when we do that, what happens is we just have this recursive step. So what we do, the way we would do it here is we would start off with Am0. We let it equal to unity, and then we just bootstrap the whole system from stage 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way to create our system of the predictors. All right? So what did we learn in this lecture? What we learned in this lecture is that there are things called, there, okay, so there are um, things called autoregressive moving average and autoregressive moving average functions, we can, in which what they do is they form a prediction of what the current value should be. It, gives an, it, it says this is what x should be, x hat, based on either past values of the output, past values of the input, w of n, or a combination thereof. That's why we have di three different types. We then moved on to say, oh yeah, there's something called the forward predictor, the backward predictor, 
the error between backward predictor and the actual value and forward predictor in its actual value, and that what it forms is a recursive relationship characterized by this equation on slide 8. Okay. So with that, um, that concludes lecture 31. So, so what we're going to do is we're going to...